Biz de Doktor İbrahim Gamar'da e, bu içten ve aynı zamanda da e, şiirlerin Farsça orijinalini ve o Farsça orijinalindeki ritmi de vererek okuyarak e, tebliğini e, sunmasından dolayı kendisine e, teşekkürlerimizi arz ediyoruz. E, şimdi son konuşmacımız gene e, Kaliforniya'dan e, bir diğer değerli e, araştırmacı. Bu konuda İngilizce'de bazı kitapları da bulunan değerli yazar Kebir Helminski beyefendiye sözü veriyorum. E, Kebir, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sayın dostlar, hoş geldiniz. I had written a paper, but I decided today that I would speak to you from my heart rather than read to you from a rather complex written paper. So if anyone still needs to get headphones, please feel free to leave and get them. Uh, if having a Turkish translation will help you. Um, my topic was going to be, and will be to some extent, sainthood, wilaya, in the example of Sultan Veled. But I also want to speak about Sultan Veled and Mevlana and Shemsi Tabriz in a, gr in a bigger context because I think these three figures and the spirituality that they represent uh, is very important for our understanding of Islam today. Um, let me start with Sultan Veled's sainthood. We know that he was not a perfect human being. We know from the Menakib al-Arafin that he had certain flaws and, and certain problems, and we will not dwell on those. We will focus instead on his, on his virtues. Any human being who is raised from the level of, of human imperfection to, to sainthood is raised by a combination of their own efforts, but also by the grace of God. So it is the power of Allah that transforms the human being and transformed our beautiful Sultan Veled. We know that he was, he was a good boy. He was a dutiful son. Um, he did what he was supposed to do. Uh, he sat by his father. He followed his father's teachings very closely. It's amazing to think that when Mevlana was first married, he was only 18 years old and 19 when, when Sultan Veled was born. So these two people went through the world almost appearing like brothers. Uh, in some way, they were, they were clo very close to each other. Um, one quality of Veled that is, is quite striking is his sincere humility. When Mevlana died, Celebi Hussamadin came to him and said, you should be the leader of this community. And Veled would have had every right to take on that role, especially since inheritance of spiritual authority has been such a common practice. But Veled said no, this authority belongs to you, the Sufi, and I am to hold the torch for you. And so for, I think, about 11 years, Veled served uh, Husamadin Chalabi uh, very faithfully, very dutifully, just as he had served Shamsi Tabriz, uh, as you know, coming back from Damascus. Veled insisted on walking and leading the horse of Hazrati Shams. So in every way, Sultan Veled demonstrated this uh, extraordinary and beautiful humility, which of course is where sainthood begins. Another aspect of Sultan Veled 
is his incredible commitment to spiritual practice, his hima. This was first shown when he begged his father to be allowed to take a 40-day retreat, even though Mevlana discouraged him from doing this. He said, you know, we don't, we don't need to do this on our path. But Valed insisted, and eventually Mevlana gave him permission and guided him in the 40-day retreat. And it was during that retreat, toward the end of that retreat, that, that Sultan Valed, as he later explained, had visions of extraordinary lights, lights as vast as mountains. And when he came back to the, to the community, he shared some of this um, with Mevlana, with Hussam Adin Chalabi, and um, uh, everyone was amazed. And most of all, amazed because Sultan Valed said that he was given the secret of a very important ayat in the, in the Holy Quran. He mentions this ayat, which is um, Surah 39, Ayat 54. I'll give you the whole of that ayat. Um, Valed said, I heard a voice which said clearly, O oh, you servants of mine who have sinned against your own selves, don't despair of God's mercy. Behold, God forgives all sins. He is Gafur and Rahim. He says, as if through the eye of a needle, this voice came to the ear of my intelligence. I fainted at its sound and saw various red and green and white tablets on which the words were written, all sins will be forgiven you except for turning away from me. So the fruit of Sultan Valed's halvet was this deep realization and understanding of the divine rahmat, of the divine mercy. All sins, all your sins will be forgiven except for turning away from me. And maybe this reminds you of a beautiful hadith, a hadith that is quoted in Bukhari and Muslim related. Uh, it was in a conversation with a, a companion named Al Muad. And um, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, said to Muad, God asks of us one thing. He asks that we turn only to him, that we associate no partners with him. And God gives to those who are faithful to this, to those who can truly say, La ilaha illallah, he promises them forgiveness of all their sins. And Muad was so excited, he said, shall I rush out and tell the whole community that this is all they need to know? And the prophet said, no, Muad, don't tell them because it may cause them to reduce their efforts. So there are truths for the elect, there are truths for the mystics, and then there are teachings for the masses. But as Valed realized, and as the prophet, peace be upon him, said, uh, God's forgiveness is very, very great. Um, and as we know, the prophet Muhammad was sent only as a mercy to the world. And this rachmet, uh, this generosity, this divine generosity, um, 
is right at the center of the teachings and the example of Hazrati Mevlana and Sultan Valed and of course Hazrati Shams as well. Um, so we have humility and we have Hima. Another interesting story was one day uh, Mevlana said to Sultan Valed, would you like to see God? And he said, yes, Father. And he said, well, begin like this. Give four hours of spiritual practice and have 20 hours of your normal life in which you do the normal things a human being does. But for 20 days, begin to reduce, to shift that number so that it's five days of spiritual practice and then six days of spiritual practice and then seven days of spiritual practice. And at the end of this period, I promise you, you will see God. So Valed was someone who sought this discipline and, this, this, uh, and with great spiritual energy, he committed himself to the path. And this, of course, led him to a third attribute of sainthood, uh, which is spiritual perception. Spiritual perception is such a beautiful subject. Um, if we were to read Mevlana's Mesnavi with this filter, if we filtered the content and we asked ourselves, what does Mevlana's Mesnavi teach the human being about spiritual perception? It would be a very interesting study. Uh, I believe the whole, the whole of the Mesnavi is, is essentially teaching us how to prepare the heart to be capable of, spirit, of true and deep spiritual perception. Well, some examples of this in the life of Sultan Valed. One comes to mind when he was looking at the Turbay and above the Turbay of Mevlana, uh, he saw a light, and he saw two lights, and they were somehow intertwined, and they were blending together. They were the light of his grandfather and the light of his father. And on seeing those, he realized that this, in fact, is all one light, and that he was part of that light as well. Mevlana, of course, said to him at a certain point, um, I speak many words, but you will be my words put into action. It's an interesting configuration to, to consider these three figures. The divine often manifests in threes. Bismillah, Erachman, Erahim, for instance. Uh, I won't mention the misunderstood co uh, concept of the Holy Trinity, but uh, there's even some truth, and Mevlana recognized that there was some truth in the Christian concept of the Holy Trinity. If I may just say, suggest that there's also something interesting in the potency, the power of Shemzi Tabriz, in the beauty on, and the, the beautiful garden of language that Mevlana created, and then in the translation of these beautiful meanings into action and into a tradition with its forms that Valed gave us. We need these three figures. We need, we need each of them. Each of them has, has a purpose. Uh, another example of Valed's spiritual perception, he said to his father one day, you know, father, when I listen to you talk, sometimes I can hear, I can hear the hall of Husamadin, and sometimes I can hear the hall of Salahadin Zarkub, and sometimes I hear the most beautiful hall of you, of your own essence, which is angelic and human at the same time. And Mevlana recognized the truth of this, and and and confirmed it. Oh yes, and he said, and sometimes I recognize the hall of Shamsi Tabriz. Uh, so spiritual perception was an attribute of this beautiful soul. 
Finally, I'm coming to a quality that I think is the fruit of the fruit, the, the mature fruit of this uh, spiritual tradition that we love so much. And I will call this Kutsal Huriet, a holy freedom. Holy freedom. Uh, the freedom uh, that is given to the mature spiritual soul. And this uh, we see in a, in a story at the end of, well, it wasn't at the end of Sultan Valed's life, actually. It was at a funeral. A funeral was taking place in Konya. And Valed arrived, and he saw that instead of a joyful funeral, everybody was walking sadly, somberly along. And he said, you know, this, what's happened? And they said, well, Aki Ahmed, the opinionated, he was, Aki Ahmed was called the opinionated one. He said, we cannot do this, that this is bid'ah, that this is not sharia, and that we cannot have singing and poetry and the sound of the neigh. Uh, and Sultan Valed, who was this very dutiful, he was a very proper and good son, he was so humble, he was so sweet, but he rose up on that occasion and he went to Ahi Ahmed and he said to him, why do you torture yourself and why do you oppress people with your opinions? He said, a man much greater than you has permitted this. And where is there a man greater than him to forbid it? Then some of the friends went to um, Sadruddin Konavi, uh, Sultan Ulama Sadruddin Konavi, and they asked him about uh, these practices of innovation and uh, the, the music and the joy that the Sufis uh, practice. And Sadruddin Konavi said these words. He said, the beautiful innovations of the saints are like the customs put in place by the prophets. The beautiful innovations of the saints are like the customs put in place by the prophets. Um, this also reminds me of a final story that I want to share with you, a story that had a profound impact on my life. It's in the Menachib al-Arafin, and I only discovered it a few years ago. In the lifetime of Sultan Valed, some, a delegation came from Medina. They had heard of the holiness of Mevlana, and they wanted to meet Sultan Valed. And when they arrived and they saw each other, they both were surprised to see that they were tying their turbans in exactly the same way. It's in the style, I think, that they call Sheker Avaz. Uh, it's a somewhat unique style at that time. And so they each wanted to know, and the Arabs from Medina, who, by the way, were the keepers of the Prophet's tomb, said, well, this tradition goes back to the Prophet. Uh, he had a vision, and in this vision, he saw a great being, and he said, Ya Allah, who is this? Is this a prophet? I don't know. Is this an archangel? And Rasulullah was told, no, this is a man who will come in later centuries to revive your religion and he will be descended from Abu Bakr. He will have a pen, and in every way, he will be like you. How extraordinary uh, to be reassured that the Islam of Mevlana is the Islam of Rasulullah. Something uh, happened to our religion 
over the centuries. The Islam of Muhammad, the Sunnah of Muhammad, in many ways was lost. And it was replaced by a legalistic mentality. And what I mean by a legalistic mentality is this. The belief that holiness is to be attained by, by performing certain rituals in specific ways and uh, following behaviors described by human beings who claimed religious and divine authority. This is not typical of our prophet. If you look to the sunnah of our prophet, really, if you analyze his actions and his behaviors, it's very clear that the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is flexibility and flexibility and concern with essence over form. Of course, he taught us the forms uh, of namaz, of fasting, of many beautiful things. And we inherit these practices as a spiritual training system. But he always emphasized and trusted the essence, the, the ma'na, the meaning of these things, and never uh, uh, uh, would never accept the mere performance of the formal outer rituals as sufficient as when he said, uh, there is no salad without huzur. There are many examples of this. So the sunnah of our prophet is flexibility and, and appreciation of the essence and the meaning of things. But something happened because human beings take the easy way out and the easy way sometimes means focusing on outer things rather than focusing on the condition of the heart. It's much easier to say do it this way and do it that way and do this and do that rather than to look into our own hearts. Now, in the early Sufi writings with people like As-Sulami, um, you find the emphasis was always on sincerity and the experience of the divine. Over centuries, beginning in the third Islamic century, particularly when Islam came in contact with Jewish legalism in Baghdad and picked up some influences from Jewish orthodoxy because the, the, the quality of Jewish orthodoxy is to perform countless outer actions uh, and to pay attention to those things. And we find that influence becoming more prominent in Islam. And we also find many concepts from uh, a highly developed Jewish law being translated into Islamic law. Some of it useful, useful in a practical way, but as a way to reach God, maybe not what we need. Maybe our attention should be on our hearts. Maybe our, our attention should be on our sincerity, on our love, on our capacity for love. Um, one final quick story showing the beautiful power of the inner uh, the inner baraka, the inner power of a saint. Valed was asked to give a chutbah, and he didn't want to give a chutbah to the masses. He said, no, this is not my business. But finally, they pushed him, and they pushed him, and he appeared before the community. But he, he, he came in front of them, and he turned his turban crooked. It was all wrong. And he began to give this, this speech, but it wasn't much of a speech. He said almost nothing. He said, um, and I'm looking for it here. This I'll have to quote to you. He says, um, when Villette mounted the minbar on this Friday, 
with his crooked turban, he began like this. He said, I learned from my sheikh, my spiritual guide, my qibla, my strength, my lord, my support, my confidence, the dwelling place of my spirit in my body, the provision of my today and tomorrow, the perfect one among the seekers of truth, my master, my father, the splendor of the truth and of religion, Jalaluddin. And at that moment, the whole community went into ecstasy and confusion, and they were only finally calmed by the presence of dervishes. This is an example of action behind words, or action without words, or, or a powerful transformative force carried by the lead. Uh, that spiritual power of his love, the love of his father, and of Shamsi Tabriz. And as I said, I think in all of this, we have an extraordinary example of a universal Islam, a humane Islam, an Islam focused on the reality of human transformation, and that can bring us to the highest perfection of our humanity. Thank you very much.